So in this short video, we're going to be looking at some of the risks of going international, including commercial risk, cross-cultural, country and currency risks. We're also going to be looking at why firms go international. It could be due to increased competition, increased market share, market knowledge, economies of scale. So if we look at the cross-cultural risk, well, cross-cultural differences arising from the differences in terms of language, lifestyle, attitudes, customs, religion, and there can be cultural miscommunications, jeopardizing cultural value, mindset, or behavior, which can have a influence in terms of your bottom line, in terms of how you communicate your marketing campaigns, how and what products you offer in terms of your product range. And as we've seen for McDonald's, you know, they carried out research into the Chinese market in terms of their habits and fast food. And they realized that the Chinese like to consume more chicken than beef. Thus, the spicy chicken burger was offered in Chinese uh, McDonald's restaurants to much success. And if we look at KFC, well, they changed their coleslaw to more familiar Chinese dishes such as bamboo shoots and shredded carrots to make it more in line in terms of their cultural differences of the foods that they like. In terms of negotiation patterns, um, when companies negotiate with other companies, well these are required in many types of business transactions. If we look at Mexicans are more friendly and emphasize more social relations before they get into business. They want to know you, they want to know who you are, who are they getting into business with. Whereas Americans are more assertive and get down to business quite quickly. So if we look at the decision making styles, well managers make decisions continually on the operation and future direction of a firm. The Japanese take a considerable more time to make important decisions whereas Canadians tend to be more decisive and shoot from the hip. If we look at ethical practices, well ethical practices do differ from country to country as regards to right and wrong ways of doing business. For example, bribery is relatively accepted in some countries in Africa, but it's generally unaccepted, such as in Sweden. Um, you know, I know some people who were trying to break into the Chinese market and they had to go through various gatekeepers. They might have had to meet four different gatekeepers before they actually got to the buyer. And each time they went to each gatekeeper, you know, the gatekeeper would say, oh, I like your pen. And then uh, my colleague would then give him the pen <laughs> and he would say, yes, here is a gift. And then he would refer him on to the next gatekeeper, to the next gate gatekeeper. And they would say, yes, they like this, they like this. And he would continually be giving them gifts in order to get through to each gatekeeper to eventually get to the buyer. And that is the way that business is done in, in certain countries at that time. So, you know, what is right or wrong? Um, is a matter for each company entering into each country in terms of their accounting standards, but they must take these things into consideration. So if we look at the country risk, well, you know, is there government intervention? Are there barriers to trade and investment? What about the bureaucracy, red tape, administration delays and corruption within government in order to get things done? Is there a lack of legal safeguards for intellectual property rights? You know, over the years, the US have accused China for uh, the, the stealing of their intellectual property rights, of their um, d inventions and designs, legislation unfavorable to foreign firms, economic failures and mismanagement, and social and political unrest and instability, which could ruin your whole business in one go. If we look at political risk, well, you know, if you had invested and started a business in Russia before the Ukraine war, where would your business be now? And if we look at China in terms of investment into China, well, the only way to go into China um, in um, 2010 was to go in with a joint venture with a 50% stake as a maximum. And the Chinese company would own a certain percentage and the Chinese government would own a certain percentage. But now there's been a change in the law and BMW Brilliance have increased their 50% stake in the company to 75% um, from that change in the Chinese legislation. And they've extended their joint venture contract until um, 2040. 
What about currency risk? Well, currency exposure, general risk of unfavorable exchange rates fluctuations, asset valuation risk and exchange rate fluctuations will adversely affect the value of the firm's assets and liabilities. Foreign taxation, income sales, other taxes are widely worldwide, you know, with implications for company performance and profitability. If you're thinking about your gross profit, and then you have your net profit and then if you've got higher income taxes then that's going to reduce your overall retained earnings and your the amount that you can actually offer to your shareholders in terms of dividends as well inflation is there high inflation you know common to most countries complicates business planning and the pricing of inputs and finished goods if we look at the Japanese yen, it's fluctuated a lot since 1985 after the Plaza Accord. The Plaza Accord was when um, America kind of devalued the dollar in order to help uh, the yen increase in value. And if we look at, you know, um, corporation tax, well, corporation tax in Germany is 30%, France is 26.5%, and Ireland 12.5%. Um, and if we look at inflation rates, well, you know, I've taken some extremes, but at one end of the scale, Argentinian inflation in November 22 was 92.45 percent, Turkey 64.5 percent, and the UK as of November 22 was at 10.7 percent. Well, this is going to, you know, it's going to affect, um, you know, your 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 cost of goods if petrol is increasing and energy costs are increasing well then your overall running cost of the business is going to increase which is going to reduce your net profit which means that that's going to force you to increase prices can you afford to increase prices if we look at the you know commercial risk if you're going in with a joint venture do you have a weaker partner um, you know do you have operation problems and what about timing of the entry? If you had timed your entry to go into another market in the US in 2008, maybe that may not have been a good time because we had the financial crash in 2008 and then people were losing their homes and people tightening their belts and not spending. What about in competitive intensity or poor execution of strategy? So, you know, these are general commercial risks such as these lead to, you know, sub-optimal Know, formulation and implementation of the firm's international value chain activities. If we look at Tesco's who entered into the US market in 2006 um, and they left the US market in 2013 losing over 2 billion US dollars. What happened? Well they faced intense competition from Walmart and not only did they face intense competition from Walmart maybe they didn't actually do their due diligence in terms of looking at their products and if they were fit for purpose in terms of the American um, target market because the portions that Tesco's were offering were the same size of the portions as in the UK but the portions seen by the American public were seen to be very small and not filling and seemed to be childlike and so it didn't actually meet the American market needs as well So, you know, the four risks of international um, business, you know, the management and the strategy of directors must always be aware of these and do their situation analysis and do their research as we've seen in KFC and uh, McDonald's looking at the products and the marketing and the communication and the cultural distinctions to actually offer different product ranges or variations of the product ranges to meet the market needs. Managers need to understand, anticipate and take proactive action to reduce their effects and some risks are extremely challenging. You know, the global financial crisis generated many commercial currency and country risks affecting banks and other firms worldwide. This led to steep declines in national stock markets and normal business activity. What are some of the reasons why firms go international? You know, firms may go international to increase um, their sales and increase their overall market size of the products that they're offering. If we look at IKEA, well, IKEA have, you know, 460 stores worldwide, but only 20 of those stores are actually based in Sweden. 
so it's higher opportunities for higher market growth um, and higher margins because this can lead to greater economies of scale if they're buying on a worldwide basis to meet the needs of 460 stores with similar type products instead of 20 stores so they can bring the overall cost down you know um, firms you know serve key customers that are you know relocated abroad when Toyota launches operations in Britain many of its suppliers followed suit so it's sometimes to be closer to supply sources, benefit some global sourcing advantages, or gain flexibility in other sourcing of products. So Apple sources parts and components from the best suppliers worldwide. Going international you can gain, you know, access to lower costs and better fat factors of production and we've seen this with Apple you know their iPhone the manufactured in China and manufacturing in China their overall costs are extremely low in terms of labor and cost of production you know a new iPhone costs over a thousand pounds but the cost of manufacture of a iPhone is between 10 and 30 pounds and so you can get the development of economies of scale sourcing production marketing and R&D so Airbus lowers its overall cost by sourcing, manufacturing and selling aircraft worldwide. Additionally, you know, confronting international competitors more effectively or thwarting the growth of competition in the home market and investing in a potentially rewarding relationship with a foreign partner. And, you know, competition is good. It's not seen as negative. Even if we look at Germany and you know, we apply Porter's Diamond model to Germany in terms of the firm's strategy and rivalry. And the str firm's strategy and rivalry, the rivalry and the intense competition in Germany, you know, means that companies have to f focus on making and meeting the needs of their customers and making their cars better and better. But obviously, additionally, with the Porter's Diamond model, you've got the demand conditions related to Porter's in industries and factor conditions um, and the government in the middle. But again, competition should be seen as a positive thing in order to help the company to focus and to be more efficient, more effective and meet the needs of their target markets.